Hello, hello, everybody. <clears throat> Let's see. Is it going to pop up? Are we working? All right. We are live. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the True Crime Talk Show brought to you by Thought Riot Podcast. My name is Brendan. Malia <clears throat> will be here any minute, um, but we are starting things a little bit different tonight. We are going to try our best to follow uh, a routine of topics. We've had quite a few people request that we cover some of the uh, some of the leading stories in true crime. So we are changing up our layout and hoping we're going to be able to do that a little bit better on this new layout. So. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. And uh, I think what we're going to do until Malia gets here is uh, go into the Idaho 4 technology related topics. Then we are going to get into some P. Diddy, Riley Strain, and finish it up with uh, some additional Idaho 4 topics, kind of the updates in the case, so to say. <clears throat> So welcome, everybody. You can find us on every podcast platform and social media platform, always at forward slash Thought Riot Podcast. And uh, we'd appreciate it if you hit that like button, leave a comment under the video, and uh, hang out with us in the chat. Let us know what you guys are thinking. There are no off-limits theories. Everybody's allowed, regardless of what your opinions are. We want you here and hanging out with us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So first topic here within the Idaho 4 case is uh, a requested topic. So quite a few people in our Discord, if you are not a part of our Discord, then you are missing out. So let me post that invite here real quick. But quite a few people wanted, wanted us to talk on the technology aspects of the Idaho 4 case and uh, <clears throat> what's expected to come in the cast report. Wait. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. All right, good to go. <clears throat> so within the Idaho 4 topic, what's expected to come in the cast report? So I don't know if you guys remember, but we covered multiple videos on technology and cell phone related topics about, I don't know, probably three months ago now. And we went through what's expected to be found on cell phone triangulation. And then we went through what you would expect to see in GPS. Now, I think we're going to find both of those in the cast report based on the, the uh, what would you call it? I'm not, I guess, declassified document of what the cast team is. Um, in that, in those videos, we went into that document and walked people through exactly what it is they do. Now, I would expect that as technology grows, so would their interest in it. So <clears throat> GPS isn't new. All right. And I think one of the things people get mixed up on with cell phone triangulation and GPS is they automatically assume that these two are the same and they aren't, they are not the same. One of them is a hardware piece that comes with uh, your manufacturer. So like, let, let's just say Apple. Okay. There's a GPS chip in every Apple phone and uh, it, within that GPS chip, it has to be, uh, it has to be, uh, it, it has an ID number that is registered with the federal government and, uh, that, uh, that chip is be, is, is able to be tracked. Okay. And, 
and and that that runs separately from the cell phone triangulation that you're you've been hearing about and expecting to see within the cast report so hang on one second i'll pull up that video and link it for you guys so you guys can go back and look at the details of that one of the things i wanted to do is go through some of the questions that everybody had within that we put out and you can actually do it right now too but we put out in one of our community posts <clears throat> a questionnaire asking if anybody had any direct questions having to do with the cast report or anything cell phone related. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Malia will be here. She's coming. She's coming. She's coming. All right, here we go. Yeah, so if you want to hop on here and ask uh, and and put your questions in there, your comments in there, I will go over those by the time that we are done here. But what we can expect to see out of the FBI cast report. So first and foremost, we are going to be getting the cell phone triangulation on Brian Koberger's phone. I don't believe there's going to be any inclusion into anybody else's phone what would be considered a data dump <clears throat> i i in court cases traditionally and we're seeing it right now within the karen reed case as well <clears throat> whenever anybody else is brought into the mix in a court case usually the judge refocuses the case back onto the defendant all right so uh, I don't foresee there being any other information in that cast report other than what is associated with Brian Koberger. Um, now, within that, I do think they're going to have cell phone triangulation. However, I don't think that's going to offer any results to anybody. There are three towers registered within the Moscow, Idaho area. And uh, we go over those three towers in depth in this video that I'm about to link right here. So I can pull up a couple of those, a couple of those pictures. And we can dig into them. But with those three towers, okay, not every tower has a a general range. Somebody shared a post with me earlier, and I think they said that it came from Malia first. Um, and in that post, this network expert is trying to explain and give everybody the rundown that uh, that cell towers generally cover 13 miles. Now, I, I don't recall if that's 13 square miles. I don't recall if that's 13 linear miles. I, I have no idea. But there are some cell phone towers out there that can go like 30 miles out one direction okay however those towers are not the towers that are in moscow idaho you guys and in this video here you can see that as well it gives the breakdown of the range now there's a million factors that go into the range of any cell phone tower okay so 5g goes a fraction of the distance that uh, like 2G goes, 3G goes, 4G goes. It it goes a fraction of it, especially when you're talking about like ultra capacity networks um, and things of that nature. So on this site that we're covering, it uh, it gives a breakdown of each of the towers, and and there's never more than two towers over the 1122 area which means they will never be able to place anybody it doesn't it's not even Brian Koberger specific you guys they won't be able to place anybody there using cell phone triangulation uh effectively and where is this I'm blind right now. I apologize. Let me see.
There we go. Okay. And <clears throat> perfect, exactly where I need it. All right, so these are the three towers in the Moscow, Idaho area. All right. And what's even worse is this tower on the on the water tower doesn't cover 1122. So only this tower does here. And this tower on the outer edges. Let me see here. Here's an example. All these are different frequencies of signal. So <clears throat> on each cell tower, there's a there's a white bar, right? And if you guys watch this video originally, I apologize. I'm going over information that we've already covered before. Um, but quite a few people asked to have us go back through this. So on a cell phone tower, there are white bars. Each one of these are a representation of one of those white bars. Hang on. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Bam. These right here. And how the triangulation works. Is each one of those bars are broken up into a sector. But... Like the best way to consider this right here is is from this line to this line. This is like 10, 10 square miles or something like that. Or right here it says 8.4. So in this equation here, this sector is 8.4 miles squared. Not real accurate. Not accurate at all. Okay. But each time you have a tower that's overlapping, that sector gets smaller and smaller right making it more and more and more reliable and even though they call it south cell tower triangulation in order for it to be allowed in a court case um there needs to be a minimum of four towers okay and in the ynw melly case they had no less than 10 towers 10 full towers in the ynw melly case they were literally able to watch him walk around a car all right and uh so it gets it gets real precise really 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 precise <clears throat> but in this case it's not and it won't be okay now in in this same series we went into GPS as well. And I'll post that video too. Hang on. In the same series, we went into GPS as well. <clears throat> and uh, GPS is a completely different system altogether. Uh, if we're going to get anything from the cast report, I expect that it's going to be geo-blended data. I think that it's likely that they could get something from the GPS. It's just going to come down to what exactly. I don't know. There's absolutely no indicators out there telling us that they've got anything from anything having to do with GPS. And they one thing they can do is uh, one thing that they can do with the GPS data and the geo-blended services. So what geo-blended services is <clears throat> has absolutely nothing to do with cell towers, you guys. It, it runs on a it it runs on different wave frequency altogether. So it is radio wave frequency 
which travels at the speed of light, but is really, really, really unreliable. So like, sorry, if you, if you turned around from the cell tower and the cell tower is right behind me, right? And your phone's in front of you blocking that GPS tower, it, it would interrupt your service. That's how unreliable it is. But within that GPS geo blended data, they can. There's so many different factors that they're running on you guys. They're running on um, what phones are within its range on its Bluetooth connectivity off Wi-Fi connected connectivity. And. uh and if they're going to get anything from that, it's going to be from that geo-blended data. Now, I saw somebody asking if Wi-Fi connection works. Yes, it does. Absolutely, it does. And I do expect to see that in the cast report as well, you guys. I do expect to see that in the cast report. Will you, will you plug in that fan? Turn it on? Mm -hmm. All right, going into these questions here. In the PCA, the records for 8458 phone show that 8458 phone utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to 1122 King Road home on at least 12 different occasions prior to November 13, 2022. <clears throat> okay, so can you please go into more detail? Was it possible for Wi-Fi connection and do cat does cast report cover that? Or is the only way CAST can get the location is in apps associated with the phone? No, from my understanding and everything that we're reading, CAST Report has full access to everything. Everything having to do with uh, network association. So that includes Wi-Fi connection. That I'll refresh. I'll refresh. Um, but... If it has to do with your phone, then I believe that they're going to have access to it, you guys. I 100% I totally believe they're going to have access to it. Now, the declassified documents that we saw outlining what the cast report is and what the, the cast report teams uh, are accountable to, what, what falls under their job description, um, that's five years past. Okay. Now imagine every five years they say that our technology doubles in intelligence. So technology intelligence doubles every five years. So the cast report team is going to need to keep up with that and they're going to double as well. Right. And they're going to start cov covering those additional features, um, which in some of our videos we've covered. Now, would they be able to see Wi-Fi connections? Absolutely, 100%. 100%. Not only would they be able to see the Wi-Fi connection from the device, but they would also be able to see it from the receiver as well. So, they say his phone was off. Now, does that mean that he doesn't have apps on there that are going to be able to show his location. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. All those things are possible. That's why when I start talking about this topic, I'm always worried because of the amount of variables. I'm always worried that I'm not going to be able to give people uh, a solid and straightforward answer, but there is no solid and straightforward answer ever. I wish there was, but there is never any solid and straightforward answer because the amount of variables that are involved with any of these, right? So if you're talking about Wi-Fi 
related services, it's going to change the variables. If you're talking about cell phone triangulation, it's going to change the variables. Uh, if you're talking about the geo blended data location services, it's going to change the variables. Now, none of that stuff that I was talking about even has to do with the background application data. That's something completely separate. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hope you're having a good night. Co-host. So what are we talking? We're we, talking cell phones? Yeah. So we're talking a customer requested, not customer, viewer requested topic of uh, cell phone triangulation within the Idaho 4 case. I figured I would start here since uh, this is a topic that I specialize in, and then uh, we will get into the other topics and go from there. Okay. Sounds good to me. So going through the questions here, all of the above, did I cover all of that? How cell tower GPS and Wi-Fi work? What is expected to be found in the cast report? Anything related to it? Why the cell phone information is not reliable? Uh, Alleged timeline of events, document filings, and hearings. So, unfortunately, that's not something I'm prepared to do right now. And that is so much research. But that is an awesome question. So, should I go into the documents and search for anything related to phones? Absolutely. I have not done that yet, and I will do that. Right now, I'm just not prepared for that. Would the environment around the area cause any issues such as spiking ping rates due to trees, rock cutouts, icy or snowy weather? Absolutely. When it comes to GPS. Now, any network signal can be impacted by the environment right so i don't know if you guys know this but in hollywood they have this uh they have the what is it is it copper rooms i think it's copper rooms where they will cover an entire room or area or outside area in copper because you can't receive any signal in that so yeah I mean, that, that's just an example to, to prove like there are a lot of different factors that can impact a, a network connection. So what about like I have a store that I go into and every time I go in that specific store, I lose service. What's causing that? Yeah, like I guess I shouldn't say that on here. <laughs> Put them on blast. I think everyone knows who we're talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, it could be. A metal roof, which most major retailers have a metal roof. Um, There's only one major retailer that happens to me in. Yeah, I think everyone knows what. Why do they do that? Do they do it on purpose? I don't know. I don't know. There could be a million different reasons. Uh, like I said, because it's it, really it could... helpful when you can use their app to look up their products to know where they are. And like, like that's super helpful. And then you can't do it because you have no service. It's yeah. super frustrating. No, I get that. But how many people are actually looking at their app shopping while in the store shopping? It has to be tons. I try to do it like almost every time. But do you think more people are on their phone not shopping in that store? I don't know. For sure. Okay, is there, so is there a, a benefit? A, is there a tactic to stop cell phone service so people are focused on the things that are in front of them, like marketing displays and presentations? So of, not being a smart shopper, being a uh, impulsive shopper? Yeah, yeah. So I, they do it by having a metal ever, roof? That's so tin hat, you guys. I just want to be clear. That is so, 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 What's so, tin so hat? tin hat. That's not um, tin hat. Oh, absolutely. And the reason why it's tin hat is because a company could never come out and claim that is what they're doing. Never. They would be ripped apart. They would? Yeah, with lawsuits for sure. Yep. Oh. Absolutely, they would. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
So I, I think that's why I would call that tin hat. But does it work? Okay. Yeah, probably. It probably works awesome. And there's a reason why they do that. But okay, sorry, I got sidetracked there. So the copper rooms, this is where I was going with that, okay? Not not to, to be Hollywood, okay? But in every wall that has electricity, what is giving us electricity to those plugs, you guys? Wires. Copper wiring. So depending on when a house was built, if they're using copper piping, copper... I just spit everywhere. Copper, and I did it again. Why are you telling me that? Copper wiring, copper pipe, because people could probably see it. No. So I'm going to call it. Um, but copper piping, copper wiring in a house, that can impact it. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I didn't think about that. It just depends on how much is there. And and that's why I lean on how unreliable GPS is. Like, the GPS runs off weight radio waves, which are the fastest, furthest waves there are. But they are the most unreliable waves, too, of frequency. So if you block, if you turn your body away from a radio wave tower and your phone is in front of you and your body is blocking it, you are going to see a massive drop in your GPS signal. Just your body. GPS? GPS, yeah. Yep. You just said a radio tower. Yeah, so GPS runs off radio waves. To radio towers? Yeah. I thought it went up to a satellite. It does. So it goes from We've... the device to the radio tower to the satellite? Yeah, you probably don't remember this topic. We covered it in the GPS video, which I need to link on here. I but, remember that video. Yes, I just don't remember that. It goes to ground transponders, to our devices, to a... Uh, a satellite like interlink system that then broadcasts it up to satellites. So like, here's an example. Mm. Okay. And Verizon is a really good one to use with this. They have, I forgot all about that. I guess they have these TV services um, that tells you how many satellites you're connected to. Okay. To give you the reliability well, you're not actually broadcasting straight up in the air going, you know, what is it, 40 something miles up or something like that to a satellite. You aren't you aren't doing that. You're transmitting to the nearest radio tower, which is, which is then broadcasting up to the satellite. That doesn't seem more reliable than cell phone towers. It's it's not. It's different. It's not more reliable. It's just different. It's just different. Well, everybody because seems GPS to think is... GPS is more reliable than cell phone towers. Most people, I think, have that perception. Yeah, it's not. It's not. I think yeah, I think you've said that before. Yeah, but... it, it's GPS is the least reliable, like by far. No comparison. It is the absolute least reliable. Where I think they're getting that from is it's the most precise. When there's nothing blocking it, you've I, I understand that sounds like it's a contradiction, okay? It is the least reliable, most precise when everything's working. So, so when everything GPS, wor is working correctly, it's pinpoint. But if yes. there's any little thing which it's easy, which yes. is easy to have, like and more frequent than not, yes. Okay. Yes. So the likelihood that you're going to have no interference is next to none. Is next to none. Like, I I just don't believe you're going to have a situation where you're going to have absolutely zero interference. Hmm. You would have to have a perfect situation, and Moscow is not that. There are buildings everywhere. 
There are trees. There are water towers. There's the, uh, uh, what's that building called? There's trees and water towers, just like every town in America. Yeah. <laughs> there is. I thought um, you were going to say the mountains, not buildings and trees and water towers. Like, that's everywhere. No, you don't need mountains. That's what I'm trying to get to people, like, explain to people. You need a body in between your phone and the GPS tower. That's it. The radio tower. A body. Well, GPS uses radio waves, therefore it's a radio tower. But yes. Hmm. So then if a body can interrupt your GPS signal, then imagine what a building can do, what a tree can do, a tree that is so much more dense. You know, that somebody thank you for pointing that out that the depth finder uses uh gps on boats and a lot of times that's really unreliable and most people that have those know how unreliable they are hmm interesting so but but understand this so here's the benefit to gps is you cannot have gps without it being a registered device with the federal government. It's impossible. Every GPS chip is registered with the FCC or FAA or whatever. FAC, FBT, I don't know, but whatever. And Brian Koberger's chip was not, or his car was not registered. Yeah. There's no GPS chip in his car, right? No, there's yeah. no GPS. Yep. Um. So... You know, antennas on water towers is actually way more common than I realized until, like, we looked into the towers in Moscow and saw the mini tower on the water tower. Yeah. I, I started paying attention to water towers, and a lot of them have little mini towers on them. Yeah, the micro towers. Yes. Yeah. Like, a lot of them have that. Yeah. I didn't realize they would just find tall buildings and water towers and stick mini towers to them yeah like randomly throughout cities yeah it's because it interrupts service so anywhere you have an interruption in service then you stick uh, a mini tower yeah interesting yeah i see someone saying that their gps is really accurate then then that means that you have a transponder that is there's nothing in between you because all radio waves act the same this is science. And, and one thing that we always talk about the true crime talk show is do not believe me. I don't want any of you guys to believe me. I don't want, I, even though I have expert experience on this topic, I, I hope to just be a carrot for you guys to go verify yourself. Um, and everything we talk about in our GPS video is scientifically backed, um, with data giving the walkthrough on it. But all GPS chips are, you know, verified and registered through the what I don't remember what commission it is through the federal government, but they all have to be registered through there. Uh, they all use radio waves. Radio waves travel at the speed of light, just under the speed of light. Um, and uh, they are super unreliable, really, really unreliable. Um, and unfortunately, this is a a one-off situation. Um, can you post the Discord link when yep. you have a minute? I did it earlier. No, I'm I'm not mixing up the GPS with cellular at all. Um, so GPS does not go directly up to the satellites. It goes to a ground transponder that then transmits up to the satellites. That's another thing that a lot of people get wrong is uh, they automatically assume because GPS is, is called uh, satellite, that everyone knows GPS is satellite, that it goes directly up to the satellites, but there has to be a, tran a ground transponder that shoots it up there. Yeah, I didn't I didn't quite realize that, but I'm sure you could just Google that. 
yeah. and it would literally pop up. Absolutely. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, it's it's interesting. It's interesting that it still goes to a tower because that's what I always envisioned in my head. Was it going straight up to a satellite? Which honestly, it sounds like it would be more accurate if it did go straight up to a satellite. It does. No, no. Why? Uh, then you don't have to worry about things between you and the thing. Okay, but so you know how many functions a satellite has? No. Think of the amount of functions a satellite has. It has to simultaneously I I don't know. <laughs> make sure that it's not crashing. It has to simultaneously re, uh, I guess, acc not acclimate to, um, to measure like where it's at in distances to the other satellites while like sending data from one satellite to another. And, uh, I'm just thinking of the right terms to use here without having to go into uh, coding talk, which is super boring. But um, what the, what our GPS network is for, and a lot of people mistake this too. They think that our GPS satellites like are around the world. They are not. They are not around the world. They actually rotate with us over the U.S. Any other satellites that our U.S. satellites going around the world are not part of what we call the GPS system. And every country has their own GPS system. Uh, I don't remember what it's called right now, but we talk about it in our GPS video. They have their own satellites. I believe our current number is like 31 or something like that. That just stay over the U.S.? Yeah, that just stay over the U.S. Correct. So they don't just like go around the world? They do not go around the world. Some we have satellites that go around the world, but we also have satellites that I forget what's that, what that's called, where it rotates with us. So it is in a, uh, it is in. It's like fixed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whoa! I didn't realize it was in like a fixed position. That's super wild. I didn't realize that at all. I I think a lot of I think a lot of people. How do they do that? I think a lot of people well because we're spinning and yeah 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 so that's how you do it they're always moving because they're constantly either i mean they can't be in in the free fall orbital trans orbital or orbital so is it about whatever, height but, or how far away it is like yeah yeah so that's not my science that i know i I don't know how to tell you the science of how they calculate and do that, but I know that they do that. And I know that uh, here, I, I could tell you what the other ones are called here. So um, other GPS style satellite systems. Okay, so it is. The U.S. is called GPS. Russian Federation is GLONASS. G-O-N-A-S-S. -S. China is Beidou. Galileo. That's what I was thinking. It was G-L-O-N-A-S. -S. Um, and European Union is called Galileo. What? Why do they get Galileo? And we get GPS. I They don't have such know. cooler names than us. Yeah. Yeah. But, Chi uh, China has their own too. But you know, satellites going over the top of us without authorization could be seen as an act of war. So how the world works in um, borders is we, there is, no, you know how when you get on the ocean, once you're, I think it's seven miles out. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think seven miles out is international waters, the rules change. You can no longer be held to the standards of U.S. law at that point. That's why on cruise ships, you can gamble at 18 um, and, and drink and things of that nature because the laws change. So are there international laws that are in the water there? I, like if you murder somebody in the middle I of mean, the water, you can be held liable by like the UN or yeah, something like the UN and <laughs> um, the rules of war and engagement uh, are, are apply in those areas. But anyways, going back to our borders, how we look at it is there is no 
like international air above us. How the world looks at it is our borders go infinitely up. So if a Russian satellite were to come over us, that could be seen as an act of war if it wasn't pre-planned, talked about, things of that nature. Yeah, like the Chinese spy balloons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the, the Chinese balloon, spy balloon or whatever. Oh, they were, balloon, they you were know? spy balloons. <laughs> yeah, I, that's I hear you. I just fact. don't want to get into the No, that's not that. a political statement. That's a fact right uh, now. It was totally used as a political it was, tool. It was, but I think everyone agrees they were spy balloons now. So, just saying. So, um, but okay. Anyway, here, getting this get back these. on true yep, crime. Yep. Let's get through this real quick and i hope i answered questions you guys everyone's questions and this is what i was trying to explain in discord when i was responding is like when people ask me tech questions i always feel really bad because i don't technology is the one area that there are so many variables in its science that there is not a black and white answer there just isn't. I can't give you a black and white answer without having the actual data from Brian Koberger's phone. Like, it's, it's just not there. Because I can't go to somebody and say, hey, the GPS is going to be reliable here. And the geo-blended data, which uses a mixture of GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi connectivity, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, what's it called? The the geo recognition or or i don't know i can't remember the word right now without looking it up but that's going to be more reliable in this situation i can't tell you that because i don't know what factors or variables are impacting that geo blended service hmm you know what I mean? And and like what could impact so that is not only the GPS signal and right. the strength of that signal, because it, in a perfect world, it'll it'll tell you where somebody is down to a half of an inch or I'm sorry, it's 18 inches down to 18 inches, um, which is a foot and a half, like super accurate. But that's if things are perfect. It. I can't tell people what d other devices are going to be around that phone, that 8458 phone, to give Bluetooth connectivity, to pick up Wi-Fi signal, to pick up the communication that technology communicates with other devices, similar to like dating apps. There are dating apps out there that you download and you instantly know who's around you, like who's looking, who's looking for tonight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and that all applies in the geo blended data but without knowing those variables and what settings are on in the phone what phones are around another device how strong the gps signal is i there isn't a straight answer unfortunately and geo blended data that's what apps use to track you uh no that's that can be anything but I mean, yes, apps have to use that, but like, how do could apps cast track report you? do that without the geo blended application data? Yes, it can. It can. It can do what? They can track you just using geo blended data services without background without apps. the app data because that GPS signal is a computer. Anytime a computer is involved. There is forever data history that you can acquire. Okay, so wait, 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 wait. So there is, your phone is connected to cell phone service, Correct. and it also has a GPS chip. Correct. Two so, separate services. Okay. So if they, is there a, so what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to ask here, is there a difference between tracking a phone using GPS and cell phone towers and a difference between using the applications to track somebody. Yes, there's a difference. If those apps are just using that GPS chip and cell phone data. Yes, it it's it's going to be determinate based on the coding of that application. And why that's important is because there are some uh, aggressive and dangerous applications out there that override your personal settings in your phone. So 
An example, let's say you have your location services turned off, your GPS turned off, which is impossible, um, but let's just say it is, okay? There are apps out there that are still tracking those things because the coding within that app, when you've agreed to download it, is saying, I'm overriding any of those settings to still track other devices around me. Because so remember, the geo blended data is not only the GPS signal coming in to your device, it is the Bluetooth connectivity and what phones are picking up Bluetooth around you, right? Let's say this is my phone. So GPS is coming into it. Cell signal is coming into it, which are two separate things. Then I have Bluetooth on and that Bluetooth is recognizing devices around me. And then uh, I have Wi-Fi on and Wi-Fi is recognizing the devices around me. That is phone specific and doesn't even have anything to do with applications yet. And between the GPS self, I'll leave the cell phone triangulation out between the GPS, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi that should give them enough variables to calculate that it will give them a really strong, reliable GPS location. And that if if we see anything in this case, I believe that is what we're going to see. I they they can't triangulate. It doesn't matter what somebody tries to say out there, you guys. And, and I don't mean this in an aggressive attacking way. I don't care what experts sound really experty and say that there's going to be cell phone triangulation. They're just wrong. They're just wrong. We don't have the towers in the Moscow area to offer that. It's not there. There aren't enough. The cast report requirements in order for a cast report member to come to court and speak as an expert is four towers, three to triangulate, four for quality uh, control. It's we it's just not there. And that would be the ideal situation is having the cell tower triangulation. It's right? the most reliable. Yep. Yeah. It's the most reliable is that cell tower triangulation. A really good lawyer could rip geo blended data apart. Because just remember every data point that you're connected to. So let's say that they say, well, we know that he was in this area because that phone picked up on three other devices and those three devices, uh, those people said they were in this restaurant at that time. Okay. Then that is a point where a really good attorney can attack the eyewitness statements of those three people and then make that situation less reliable. Hmm. You know what I mean? It, it adds more variables and more variables on the table means more attacking attack points for a good attorney, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And okay. I, I want to know if Brian Koberger is the guy. We say this every time, like every, every, every time, you guys. Uh, the best outcome is Brian Koberger being the guy and being guilty. That is the best outcome because that means we don't have a fifth victim currently in jail. Uh, that means that we don't have psychotic killers out and about in, in the general public or in the world. Like that is the best situation. However, we've got to have sound science and data to convict in my opinion. Yeah. And I'm not willing, no matter what the situation is, budge on the expectation of sound data and science. Otherwise you get Missy Yvonne Woods, which we covered just last week, the DNA uh, analyst and expert that went 30 years and now has over 2000 cases, 2000 cases that are going to be retried, looked into unreliable manipulated and who knows what right it's a really awful situation <laughs> yeah can you imagine the people having to relook through all those cases oh my gosh it's horrible it is horrible. I, my my first thought was did anybody die because of this oh put to death yeah yeah Guess we'll find out.
Yeah. And, and just to be clear for everybody else. So a lot of people ask me and think that when a phone's connected to cell towers, which is different from what we've been talking about, if a phone is connected to a cell tower, it is simultaneously con uh, communicating with all towers within range. It's prioritizing the data on one tower, but it's recognizing the other towers in the area. So let's say there's three towers where I'm at right now. My phone is connected to all three towers right now. Even though if I pick up the phone and make a call, that call data is going to go through one. Hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, let me see here. So, uh, could an app be made and downloaded onto someone's phone for the purpose of tracking food purchases from a food vendor, but actually the real purpose of the app is to track a person's location? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. There are a million apps out there or more right now that have uh, an undercover motive. Uh, and, and, and that motivation is to get personal data and information, not actually offer a service. And that's why when before you guys download any apps, OK, everybody, it, it doesn't matter how old you are, how much experience uh, you have in technology, check reviews on apps before you download them because you can't download an app without agreeing to their terms of service. It's impossible. You can't. You cannot download an app and not agree to their terms of service. Downloading so, it is agreeing. Downloading it is agreeing. So the only option is, is to check reviews and verify that it is a trusted application. And there are apps out there that will make themselves appear very close to trusted apps, but aren't. And you can usually tell by the amount of reviews they have. What are you looking for in the reviews to know? Uh, quantity. Trustworthy apps have a large quantity of reviews and above four stars. Yeah, I, I totally didn't want to stay on this topic this long just because we've covered it quite a bit. But hang on, uh, I'll post those videos. Are there any other questions on that community post? Uh, I don't know. Or if you want to post the GPS video and the cell phone triangulation. Okay. Wh whichever one. Here, I got the cell phone triangulation. Okay. All right. So, cast viz is so misunderstood. Judge didn't even know what cast was. Yeah. Yeah. To to be fair though. To be fair. Technology isn't everybody's strong suit. You know what I mean? Do I think there's an argument there that Judge Judge should should have been researched enough to know these terms and words and and things that could come up in the case? Maybe, but we don't know what's going on in his personal life. And and I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, so I am going to give him the benefit the benefit of the doubt in here. On this situation, even though, yeah, it's kind of strange. Kind of strange. Look at the ceilings and high up on the walls in your closets. I don't know if you have an attic or basement. Check in those areas as well and all services include. I found an electric panel for a house we were thinking of buying in the kitchen cabinet. Oh, weird. Yeah, I've definitely heard of that before. You said get the GPS video? Yes. Okay, yes, I yes. Okay, so the affidavit mentions two similar time periods, TikTok camera uh and later Brian Pings or 912 to 921 a.m. Is there a chance law enforcement made a time conversion mistake? Mm. 
I think anything is possible. I can tell very clearly that there's mistakes in the way they presented and represented the cell phone triangulation. So I think that's very possible. And if they did make an error, would that make Brian less suspicious of involvement? I don't think so. Human errors are expected, right? I I don't see there being any issue with human error. I tend to see issue when there's a an obvious error and instead of correcting the error, we're trying to cover that error up. You know what mm. I mean? Why do people think cell phone pings mean that Brian Koberger was in the 1122 driveway? It, absolutely. I, I agree with you. It doesn't mean anything. And uh, what I was showing earlier, you guys here, hang on. Do I still have it up? I do. Okay. So what I was showing earlier here is this. Okay. So cell phone towers are split up into triangles is the best way to uh it, the best way to think of it and each side has multiple white antenna bars all right so this is the tower here and there's multiple white antenna bars on each side here each of these antenna bars are are sent out with like i think it's a 40 degree angle i think all each of them cover 40 degrees um but that one will be sent out Oh, you didn't see it. So imagine this is the cell tower and the each side, there's going to be a bunch of white bars here, right? And one of them will be out this direction. One will be this direction. One will be that direction. And one will be that direction. And it'll go on each side. Well, one phone can only be connected to one of those, those bars, those white bars. And they will communicate with both simultaneously but that they'll only be in or one tower will show you the reference of like 8.4 miles in in this example not all towers are going to be like 8.4 square miles of coverage it's just this example here but to to explain why it's not that reliable because and i guess i can go a little bit further but we go we go into it so in depth in the videos that we're posting here you guys that's why i just didn't want to go through that same content again but uh cell phone towers can track your rtt time which is round trip time that round trip time is the service coming from the tower to the cell phone in your hand and back to the tower again right and it that tower tells you exactly how fast it goes to your phone and back we're talking milliseconds like millions of a second okay it is that fast and uh Based on that RTT time, it gives you an average of distance away from the tower. Now, because each side covers um, 60 degrees or, right? So 360, so 120. So, duh. Each side of the tower covers 120 degrees. Uh, it can only tell you roughly how far it is in 120 degree direction with one tower that's why you need a second tower here like let's assume the phone is right here where this arrow is and that second tower covers right here now we know that it's down to this right here instead of all of this right then let's say we had a third tower and that third tower goes right here then we know that it is within this area right here now there are cases out there where it is very, very, very trustworthy and uh, precise, like the YNW Melly case. They literally used cell phone triangulation and saw him walking around the car. Mm-hmm. So. It was super, super accurate. Yeah, it was. It was. But I hope I answered everybody's questions there, you guys. Um, and... Uh, 
we are going to move on to uh, some of the next topics we have for tonight, and we're going to come back to Idaho 4 too. It'll be at the end of the True Crime Talk Show. Um, but if you have more questions on this topic, please leave them in the questions. Leave them in the comments, and I will get to them. Uh, there isn't a network question out there that I can't answer but some of them are just a harder answer because of the amount of variables and details that come with technology. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't learn and grow our knowledge and figure it out together. You know what I mean? For sure. So I hope that helped you out guys. And, uh, we will move on here to, uh, the, what do you want to do? Riley strain or P Diddy. What's new in Riley Strain? Uh, so Riley Strain, I wanted to talk on the community's expectations and some of the topics that are being put out there. So there's been a few questions that have been asked recently, right? So we have the second autopsy. That second autopsy aligns with the first autopsy. No water in the lungs, things are missing, uh, no pants, um, and uh, we're waiting on the toxicology report. Now, in the news, there were a couple questions that were put out there, okay? There's this idea that the true crime community expected, not expected, needed this to be needed there to be a suspect in this case that the true crime community was unwilling to accept that it could have been an accident. It it almost feels a little bit of like gaslight tea, you know? Yeah, you should make us full screen again. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That's why you get the big bucks. Um, but yeah, that's a little weird. I mean, I think that's a weird thing to say. I feel like there's just a lot of animosity towards the true crime community. And if I'm being honest, and this may seem a little bit, you know, tin hat, I heavily believe that certain things are said and put out there to create a divide in the true crime community and also push certain people in certain directions. Um I don't know. I feel like there's this control of information and I see almost like a push. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how else to say it. I see like a push. Yeah. No, I, I'm i right there with this you. This is and, how to think. This is what to think. And with this new format, you guys, now that we're covering some of the other cases and things of that nature, I'm still getting my uh, bearings here. What I should have done is gave a rundown of Riley Strain. Uh, I hopped in assuming that everyone knew and watched the original video. But Riley Strain was a 22-year-old uh, fraternity member a from senior. Mizzou. Yep. Uh, out of Missouri, who went to yeah. Nashville to party with his fraternity and have an event there. He went yeah. out uh, one night on what night? Do you remember the date? It was March 8th. March 8th. Uh, and ended up getting kicked out of a bar. Luke Bryan's bar. Yep. Yep. And ended up getting kicked out of a bar where he can then be seen walking through the city, ultimately uh, going missing and after 14 days being found face down in the river. Only five miles upstream when they expected him to be like over 30 miles away. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And now, he was missing his pants and his shoes and had no water in his lungs. Oh, missing his phone and his wallet. Still had his Apple watch on and his yes. shirt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, us included, have asked questions around, hey, this kind of feels smiley face ish. You know what I mean? There's a certain MO out there, and this MO feels similar. So, like, it doesn't mean that's what happened, but it's worth asking the question, right? So, that question earlier just got me thinking, though, that. Could that be true that 
the true crime community got so bought into Riley Strain as a person that we weren't willing to allow it to be self-inflicted. Self-inflicted? Accidental. Whatever you want to Make call us it. Make um, I don't think it's bought into him as a person. I don't think that's the issue. I think it is... What? Oh, I do. I think these cases get popular because people buy into them as people. They hear their history and background and people are like, man, I have a son that age or I have a uh, a boyfriend or like people relate to these stories of just going out with their friends and drinking. And then all of a I'm sudden, sure can you imagine? No, I'm sure that's true, but that's not what makes me bought in. Okay. What makes me like the person to me is a person and I appreciate all people equally. So that's not what's important to me. Sure. Um, it, it, you know, because I do think somebody said that actually on the news or like, yeah, I mean, it's like a white, you know, blonde, young man in a fraternity at a school. And that's why everyone cares so much. Like literally said that on the news during his case. And I was like, whoa, maybe not the best thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do I think there's some, there could be some statistical proven issues there? Maybe I, I haven't looked into those statistics oh, there, in a long time. There are some uh, statistical but during this investigation is not the right place to bring that up when you should be focused on. No, the, uh, so I the agree. Victim or, I, or, or, uh, the, uh, finding person, him loss of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finding him. He was missing. We didn't know the yeah. loss of life yet. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't feel like it was the best thing to say, but it, the person isn't what's important to me. It's it's certain things within a case that like just draw me in. Now, there are some cases where it's the person like for the Watts case. It was the kids. Mm. The kids killed me yeah. in that case. Like it was horrible. Other cases, it's not so much about the person and their personality. It, it's not that I like don't connect with them or care about them. That's not the point. Like I care about them. Sure. It's more about the aspects of the case that are mysterious. And it's like, what is going on here? Yeah, like this wanting seems, to understand. It's, it's like it just, yeah, you just want to understand. You want to know why. You want to know why it happened. You want to understand like how it could have happened. And that's what was fascinating about Riley's case for me is how did he end up that messed up after a single drink stumbling through Nashville, which at the time I knew as a very safe city, which apparently it's not so much now. And he ends up stumbling down the street and literally just like his phone and his watch turn off at the same time and he's gone. Like, just vanishes without a trace. Yeah, the details that are is strange. very mysterious. Yeah. You know? So, I, was, I mean, it's just weird. It's just weird. So, that's what fascinated yeah, me. Yeah. No, and I know the area extremely well. It, I So, I was thinking, like, I the whole time, like, where could he have gone? I agree with you. But one of the questions I always come back to, taking it real philosophical, right? I can't help but think like that, you guys is how much weird mystery is standard in any case because we know there are problems in every case right there is no perfect case there is no perfect crime there is no perfect investigation there are always going to be some dots that don't most connect. most so are like, straightforward most are straightforward the select few are mysterious. Right. Okay. There are well, fewer that have that air but, of mystery than are straightforward. Like Chad Daybell, there's no mystery there. Yeah. And by the way, Chad da Daybell, we just went through jury selection today. The most boring thing ever, but one of the most <laughs> Super important boring. things in a case. Uh, it is. So, you know, I, I watched most of it, not all of it, most of it. Really interesting. Um but uh, with the Riley Strain case, um, do you think the national media focused on this situation and was unwilling to accept the accidental death? 
Hmm? Say that. Ask that again. I said, do you think that it's possible that mainstream media and the true crime community could have been unwilling to let this story go? And that's why I don't think it's an accident. Right. So I don't know. I, I have do you no think idea. It was driven I, by the parents. Like the, the questions I'm asking here is trying to figure out the why behind the obsession with this case. I understand that it is like a kid that's right on the verge of starting his life, just going out, hanging out with the boys and partying, whatever. Uh, and this should never happen. Um, but I think that there are very clear question marks and there was already a layer of doubt before he was found. Personally, I felt like there was already doubt in this case before he was found, well, which is further reflected think, by the parents who are like, eh, we should need to get a second autopsy, which I probably would have done the same. No, I'm not they should do that. Down for it, that, but. that does not add to the mystery for me. The second autopsy does not add anything to mystery. That is what you should do. That is what you should do. If your kid went missing and is found dead and they do an autopsy, you should always get a second opinion, mm. no matter what, whether you have questions or not. If you can, you should, um, just in case. You know what I mean? Like, because you can't, you can't have the same evidence years later if something were to be found out. Yeah. Having it yeah. done right in the beginning is the ideal time. Even if you have even just a single doubt in your mind, like maybe, like maybe something else happened that night and the cops just aren't seeing it. Yeah. You should get a second opinion. But no, I, there's nothing wrong with second opinions. The, the, the scientific method is three, right? My so. issue with his case is it's anomaly after anomaly. How did his phone and his watch turn off at identical times when both are either waterproof or water resistant? And his, like, it just doesn't make sense. How did his uh, jeans and his boots come off? And how does he have no water in his lungs? That's anomaly, anomaly, anomaly. I agree. Yeah. There's so many anomalies that it's like, I don't believe in coincidences like that. Yeah. If it were a single coincidence, like everything else made sense, except for his pants were off. And you're like, well, that's weird. But everything else makes sense. That would be a totally different thing. It's yeah. how many things don't make sense. And we haven't been given answers to those. So if they can answer me how his phone and his watch got turned off at the exact same time, if they can answer to me how his pants and his shoes came off because he was wearing jeans and not loose jeans. They were tight jeans. Yeah, you know what's interesting? And they were wet if he was in the river trying to take them off. Like, that is so difficult. Yeah. And I did write a few questions here just because I didn't want to forget about it. But um, so we are still waiting on the toxicology. And Do GHB could have already been going to test for GHB. I hope his parents push for it. I so for anybody that's watching GHB is not on the standard testing panel no. when they do toxicology yeah. um for a body for in in any situation it doesn't matter what situation uh you have to specifically request it and uh it's expensive it is really 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 expensive and uh it it has to be approved by the investigator it has to be uh approved by um you know the state the the investigative party and uh I think it's the only thing that makes sense here. I've gone through the last few days trying to figure out what other chemicals it could be. And I personally don't think there are any other chemicals that it could be other than. Well, and GHB, GHB. is what's used commonly to it's called the date. Can I say that word? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. You know, what? you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Where It's put in people's drinks and things like that to carry out like SA attacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and 
It is odorless, tasteless. It can be used as a drug. Some people use it for their own experiences. It's also used by bodybuilders. Um, and it takes such a small amount, you guys. In this situation, I hope there was enough focus on this case that they don't have a choice but to check for this. I really hope so. I got to use the restroom real quick. Shout out here to, uh, does it let me highlight? Not from there, I don't think. Yes, anti-hero, we appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you want to finish up on this and then we'll go into Diddy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so Diddy. much, anti-hero. That's super generous. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I still have a ton of questions in the Riley case. Um, you know, I think that it's very possible he was drugged or maybe not. Maybe this isn't, it doesn't have to be a crime that was planned ahead of time from the bar. Um, that could have been a misfortunate situation where, you know, somebody, a, some kind of predator on the streets saw this kid who was super messed up because he went to two other bars before Luke Bryant's bar. So it could have been a situation where he got really messed up. And by the time he got to Luke Bryan's bar that like, cause I've been thinking this whole time, he ordered two glasses of water and a drink two glasses of water to me sounds like trying to sober up so did he get to luke bryan's bar have another drink and was like whoa uh, i shouldn't have had that other drink i am really drunk and then started drinking water you know and was like oh i need to try to sober up but he was getting kind of i don't know but at the same time it doesn't make sense why he got kicked out then like if he was actively trying to sober up then how was he like you know, not conducting himself appropriately enough to, and then gets kicked out. Kind of weird to me. I, I don't fully understand that. But anyway, so he's super drunk. He gets kicked out. Maybe he wasn't drugged. And then he's super messed up and he falls and hits his head and somebody sees him, like how messed up he is. And that's, he's a victim of opportunity. He gets robbed. They take his pants, which are pretty expensive pants. Uh, they take his boots. They take his wallet. Um, you know, they take maybe his phone. I don't know. Something like that. They say they don't see any foul play, but maybe it didn't take much to like, maybe he passed out. Who knows? I don't think it has to be planned ahead necessarily, but there's things there that are sketchy and I feel like need answers if they want the public to believe nothing wrong happened here. And I absolutely think people saying that everybody bought into Riley so much that they just can't let this case go and they need somebody to blame is gaslighting and looking over the weird anomalies here like these they're not normal things in an accident yeah they're yep. not yep make sure you hit that like button and leave a comment under the video thought rioters and just a reminder we still have quite a bit to go here but just a reminder we are going to have a members only after this that you can join uh by becoming a member and i will post that link now um but final thoughts on this one i am waiting for this toxicology report. I think it is very important. Um, I think that it will be eye-opening. However, I still have not heard if his level of decomp matches. That's what I want to know. How long he was believed to be in the water. We are expected to believe that he was in the water for the entire 14 days. Does somebody that is expert at identifying the markers of a of a 
body, a corpse that that's been in the water that long, also see this? Those are my big two questions there. I agree. I think that the direction to go in any case, it doesn't matter. Okay. This is a very sad situation. Uh, Riley strain was just taking off in life, right? He was just there to have a good time. And he fully expected to wake up in a bed tomorrow, the next day. And that didn't happen. Um, and it's really sad in this situation and the way forward in any sad situation or crime situation is science in my opinion and i think we need to look to the science to explain the why yeah i i personally think that the demographic matches smiley face but the details around it don't match what we've seen in other potential smiley face situations however None of those situations got the coverage that this one did. None did of it, them. Did it interrupt something? Yeah. I have serious questions about where his body was found and why it didn't travel as far as expected and t what's typical and normal and what the decomp was. That's, yeah. I think that Closing matters more statement. to me than the toxicology, though the toxicology is pretty important. Yeah, I think that toxicology is really important because, 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 um, let's say, let's say there wasn't a homicide here. Let's say he was drugged. There's still some accountability there, liability in yeah. that. There absolutely is. Um, go to Stard. Oh, and all right. Member for six months. Love the beard. I appreciate that. What? I'm not a beard. Oh, love the board. Love the board. I was about to say. Um, I need my eyes checked, don't I? Um, the skateboard. Yeah, I love it too. And thank you so much for being here for six months. And you know we love you. Yes, indeed. All right, so, yes, Diddy on the docket, you guys. This is the first time we're covering, like, multiple topics like this, so we got to get in our groove here, okay? And we appreciate you guys hanging out with us while we figure it out. Um, we are adding additional elements to the show uh, to become one of the few live podcasts out there, truly live podcasts out there. Um, so just bear with us. We are working on it and figuring it out. And you guys have been awesome and just keep doing what you're doing. But, uh, P Diddy, what do you know? I don't know a lot other than that. He has been accused of SA sex trafficking, drug trafficking. That's pretty much it. And using people like other famous people. Yes, you are correct. Now, and they raided like all of his homes at once, didn't they? They did. Just recently, you guys, P. Diddy, Sean Puffy Combs is a music mogul, right? Rode the uh, train of success when. We had stars like Tupac and Biggie Smalls coming up in the industry. Mm -hmm. He hit it big and made very smart business decisions in the music game. Uh, created, uh, he had really good investments, created some vodka and alcohols. And, uh, you know, it, it, all in all, he became a, a, a billionaire. Okay, he has a lot of money. I believe he's billion. I could be wrong, but he he is very, 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 very wealthy. And we saw that in the rating of his home. Now, <laughs> it does um, not surprise me at all. Ashton, Ku Ashton Kutcher was friends with P. Diddy. He was also friends with what's his face? Um, what's his name from 70 show? What? 70 show. Uh, Gosh, what is his name? Oh, oh. Masterson. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Dan- and uh, Danny Masterson. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually did watch. Do you know uh, what is what band is she from? Aubrey, um, Aubrey O'Day or whatever. She's from that. Gosh, what is the band? The girl band. I have no idea. Well, I think she got on that band through a show. Okay. Right. Or they had a reality show and P and she did an interview about P Diddy um, or just Diddy, I guess now, um, where she talked about his treatment of her. And I saw that a while back. And like, I don't know if she's done a new one or not since all of this is going on. But a while back when I saw where she talked about how he treated her on the show and everything, it was pretty awful. Like he was emotionally and mentally abusive straight up. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a lot of questions with this, though. Uh, and I think a lot of people do. Oh, Danity Kane. Too. Thank you. Danity um, Kane. So, to give everyone the rundown, right? Puff Daddy, Sean Combs, has been believed to have, uh, based on what we're hearing. Now, I, I want to be very clear about this. These allegations just came out. There is nothing that backs it right now other than civil cases that have been uh, NDAs signed and payments made to uh, to close it out. OK, so he settled every single one. He settled every single one. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and for me, that is important when I'm looking at the details of this. Right. Because of the statement I just made when we were covering the Riley strain topic, and that is science tells all right. If I let my emotions lead me nine times out of 10, I'm going to be led astray, you guys, right? And I am not a big P. Diddy supporter or anything like that. I just want to know the facts. Right, of course. The yeah. most facty facts, right? Um, well, we have the allegations filed against Sean Combs. So it has been a brutal year and a half for him. He had uh, his ex, Cassie, what's her real name? Do you remember off the top of your head? I don't, I don't remember. Do you want to look it up real yeah. quick? So his ex, Cassie, they were with for, they were together for 10 years, 10 years. Is it has, Cassandra Ventura? It is Cassandra Elizabeth Ventura. And, uh, she has made claims and took him to civil court, uh, claiming that she was trafficked for 10 years that he was verbally abusive oh that he was physically abusive that he forced her to have uh you know uh, relations with his friends and random models that he would sometimes pay for sometimes not um and there are some wild details in there i believe he called it their uh what was it f f o time I think F O funky something or another time. Um, But that settled out of court. Okay. Well, yeah. So these allegations have been going on for years. It's just, they actually, the feds actually started raiding and doing something about it. It's been going on for years. Not court cases, not court cases haven't been going on. Uh, until the last like year and a half, two years. I know in the early nineties he was uh he was associated with a uh, I'm not talking case, that far like, back where a woman was claiming that she was drugged and taken advantage of, R worded, right? Um, and then there is also that other claim that Sean Combs shot a woman in the face, not intentionally, but in an argument with another individual. So, like, are there concerns out there? Can I have, have people been pointing fingers at Sean Combs for a long time? Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about, though. I didn't mean like all the way back in the 90s. I mean, like the past couple years. Is, okay. It, it, yeah. This has really been coming out. Several people have came out and filed lawsuits. Yes, you're and right. you're saying they've all been settled, which I did not know. Um, yeah. Yeah. They they have but all been can, settled want, up until recently where um, it. Go ahead. 
Do we know um, where Diddy came from? Did he come from like the hood gang yes. gang life? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. He, uh, Sean Combs was believed for a very long time to be involved with Tupac's um, hit, his murder. Yeah. He was uh, the founder of Biggie Smalls. Um, and uh, he has been known in the industry for a long time to be a super freak. And I, I'm not saying that to be funny, right? I think a lot of people have this idea of the, the rich community or Hollywood or the music industry that there are freaky people in it, right? But it becomes an issue when there is no consent, when there is no, uh, when any yeah. measure of force becomes a part of the situation. Now, you have Joy Dickerson Neal, who in 90, 1991 said that she was drugged and, and R-worded. Uh, you have two other cases, which are a Jane Doe. Jane Doe, one, claims to have been R-worded by him uh, 30 years ago. And then Jane Doe, two, claims to be R-worded by him when she was 17. Now, in 2024, we're all caught up, right? Mm -hmm. We have the federal government now taking an interest in this. We had the Rodney Jones case come forward where he is saying that Sean Combs forced him to hook up with friends and put himself in compromising sexual situations, um, saying that he essentially is a kingpin of sex trafficking. A kingpin, a kingpin of sex trafficking. That's the um, claims here. I just put the membership link in the chat for whoever needed it. You guys, I saw it being asked for, um, so it's in there. Um, but a kingpin is wild. It, I mean, it, that's a very strong word, and I always get a little bit nervous anytime we people are bringing up claims with such strong. What? Accusatory what words mean? like a kingpin. Why do you get nervous about that? Um, in in our understanding of what a kingpin is, right? You're talking uh, Colombian soup. What's his name? I'm drawing a blank. Escobar. Right? Es yeah, Escobar. Pablo Escobar, right? A kingpin. Um, a, a, he is okay, the but... top of a huge organization, right? So there's this, uh, there's this social connection with the definition of what a kingpin is. What we're seeing Sean Combs do is not a good representation of what we have classically seen, uh, the definition of a kingpin so a be. King... So it could mean that these are exploited terms, whereas, the smaller charges might not stick if there really are smaller charges here. Is this this situation is getting blown up like a balloon, right? Massive. And it if the public doesn't see him as a kingpin managing multiple people on an Epstein level playing ground. This case could not go anywhere when there's real victims at hand. That's my concern. Okay, so Kingpin, you're saying it would be like Epstein. a stream, a stream of trafficking, like a, of international type tra trafficking, mm -hmm. millions of dollars type trafficking. Correct. I mean, and wouldn't you say that's what a Kingpin is? The head of an organization. <laughs> with multiple people running underneath you in managing this. I, th I mean, maybe that word was used and it's maybe a little bit strong, but I could see Ooh. a world where Diddy could be um, a leader in trafficking among a certain group of upper echelon type people like Cassie. She's an example, that type of, that type That's of clientele, that nervous. type of high-end girl, 
but that's why I get nervous so, when so I maybe... hear stuff like this because it's an exploitation of vocabulary to character assassinate and and a lot of times that loses the smaller charges and yeah, victims. But he could be the leader of high-end girls like that though. okay but if he's not a kingpin like is being talked about everywhere i'm this is the most commonly r referred word to sean combs right now as kingpin is he a kingpin like epstein has been shown to be traveling the world taking women with him everywhere for the the wealthy is sean combs going to be that i think it's possible i don't i, I do. don't i do he made his money elsewhere he did not make his fortune on trafficking so we think that he he's going to be like oh you know what i've made a billion dollars on money but I'm going to go be a professional sex trafficker. To me, that just doesn't feel very likely. And if there are real victims here with real evidence of that, scientifically backed evidence of that, then I want accountability to be had. That's what I'm worried about. So do you think it's possible that this is a situation where he wasn't making a ton of money off of it, but he was doing it because of like the notoriety and passing girls around the way that kind of culture does and they're being trafficked in a way, but not like, not like Epstein level trafficking and the transaction met, might not be like, you know, give me a thousand dollars and you can have her. I, it could be like, I'm passing wondering, women around. I'm yes, I, I do think that. But and I'm also wondering that. Look, a decade ago, and I'm not going to get political with this, you guys, but there was no such thing called enthusiastic consent. OK, we have seen time and time and time and time and time and time again that these behaviors and situations of wealthy people age very poorly. <laughs> the worst kind of poor right <laughs> and sean called it's very bad it's very bad it's an understatement it it is an understatement i agree with you and it's i'm not taking, criminal <laughs> i'm not taking anything away from the possible victims in these situations but did these victims very clearly at this time at those times come forward and say I don't want any part of this. I'm out of here. Goodbye. Now I know Cassie says that she did do that and she got abused for it. Wow. And I think that maybe could be part of the reason that it was handled outside of court. Hmm. But we got to remember like the drama is nice and interesting and, and whatever. But we've got to have evidence here. Yeah. And the evidence is Sean Combs wasn't arrested. He hasn't been arrested. No, there is no arrest warrant for Sean Combs. Interesting. There is no um, arrest warrant. And before I forget, huge shout out here to Cynthia gifting five memberships. That is incredible. And we appreciate you. You are another one who has been here with us for quite a long time and thank you thank you thank you very much yes thank you so much cynthia <laughs> um but i do think that that was hollywood culture for a very long time i mean so, i went to school in la and sex was a culture yeah so it really was we got a comment um saying that diddy was doing this and then building up blackmail to use later on people Okay. That you're missing a major part of the story that he was collecting blackmail. I just haven't seen that part of the story. I, I, I appreciate you giving that shout out, but I, I hope to get some more of that evidence because that would fill a large hole for me to help me understand why the feds are involved. That is something I did not understand. 
that he's had four or five civil cases and the feds are now involved. Hmm. You know what's interesting? You want to know something interesting? What? His whole family was at his home, okay? And I'm, I know I'm going a little conspiracy here. His whole family was at his home. Right before the feds show up, him and his contact, his mule, I don't know if he's an actual mule or if he's just a hang around that manages these things for him, uh, go to get on his private jet to the Caribbean. That mule, Brandon something, uh, gets arrested and has drugs on him. But they leave before the feds get there. Okay. And go to the Caribbean. Did Diddy know? Did Sean Combs know ahead of time? Why would they be taking a bunch of dope with them to the Caribbean, you know? Why wouldn't you? If you're going there to party. Yeah. I'm just wondering like you don't if traffic there's a way to, to the Caribbean. At, not normally, no. I'm just wondering <laughs> if there's a way that this could be looked at from a different perspective. We see a man that ang angered a lot of people in the industry. He was suing a company for racism, okay? Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. He was suing a company yes. for racism, and uh, he was... Uh, he was talking against the music industry and Hollywood and how things were done. He also aligned himself with some political affiliations. Um, and he was catching cases, civil cases, one after another. Could the feds have been involved to squash these civil cases? Could the feds have been involved to squash these civil cases? Maybe. I guess. Uh, I know that I saw somebody also say that he there was a statement that he was an FBI informant. But I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I have to look more into the details of this because it's something I, I don't know much about yet. Um, I only know what you're telling me so far, but I it's think possible, I guess. A really interesting case because there are so few explanations here i don't think people understand how rare it is to go from civil cases to the federal government being involved that is not common at all that is not common oh, i didn't really think about that it is not common hmm. did one of these civil cases become unhappy with the agreement and took it to the feds hmm. every lawyer that i've seen speak on this said that there is no other way the feds are involved somebody is working with them so it's interesting it's interesting I'm going to keep an eye on it and uh, because I just want to know the evidence here, right? Mm -hmm. I want to know the evidence. There's a lot of very big words that are being thrown around you guys. Like, thank you, uh, KB, for uh, Rico, Kingpin, all these massive words are being thrown around. But where's the evidence for those? And I am not trying to claim Sean Combs is innocent. Absolutely not. I just want to understand the situation a little bit better. Yeah, I do too. You know? I do too. I want to understand it better. Absolutely. We need to look into it deeper for sure. I just want to see so the evidence because look, there's nothing wrong with being freaky. Where it becomes wrong is if you're trafficking someone, if there's no consent and you're forcing situations on people. Right, like Cassie's um, situation, as she explained it, is extremely wrong. Absolutely. There are groupy type girls absolutely. that want to be that person. Absolutely. And you can find them. Yep. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Don't force it on somebody. Yep. 
was he a sadist and took some kind of pleasure in forcing someone? Well, I, that I was don't kind know. of the allegations against, um, you know, one famous person case that I did dig into some was uh, Marilyn Manson's allegations against him from a couple of his ex-girls. And those were situations where I think that there was consent, but one bit of consent made him think he had consent to go all the way. Like, consent has to be reconfirmed yeah. over and over and over, especially in a situation that's that hard on a person. Like, that, that there's certain situations where it's like, it's not socially well, the social uh, norm. So you have to continue it's to get a consent. Political topic. It's so hard and and unfortunate that it's a p political topic. But yes, you need to be observant of the person in front of you. Absolutely. Um, and but if you're I don't damaging want, them, I don't want to seem unrealistic. That when you're hooking up with someone, I do not believe that you need to. Hey, okay, is it okay if we go from kissing to this? Hey, verbally, is it okay if we go from this to this? Hey, is it okay if we go from this to this? Listen, we we are good at reading our our environment. We're good at reading people, humans in general, I mean. We can pick up when someone is into what we're doing or they aren't, right? I think most people can. I think if you get to a point where you're unsure, then maybe you check I think in. there's just some people that are just so sadistic. Like Marilyn Manson, he took that one bit of consent and took it all the way, and he's so sadistic that it didn't matter. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just don't know anything about his case, so I don't have any comment. Yeah. I have no idea about Marilyn up. Manson or anything having to do with that. Um it's super messed up. And I think the shock factor of what he was doing blinds people from what, like, the actual wrong of it is. Yeah. Yeah. My, my and I think that could be something if, here, too. My big concern is if somebody said no and, and, and that was continued to be pushed. Because, listen, consent is on both sides of the table, regardless what anybody says. If if you're unhappy with something that's going on, you have to be confident enough to say no, stop, not into it. Otherwise, my suggestion is don't get into situations where you could be in a situation like that until you're in a place where you're confident enough to say that. Right. Don't be in a relationship if you can't say no. I agree. I you just agree. shouldn't be in a relationship it, with it, anybody. It requires mutual conversation and continued, uh, you know, adaptation, reading of the yeah. situation, body language, uh, in enthusiasm, things of that nature. But I absolutely believe that if somebody is unhappy with the situation that's going on, they need to be able to verbalize that and say, hey, stop, stop. I, way too fast, okay? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, not being able to say no is not a pass. Like if somebody's literally passed out, that's not a pass. Well, oh, like, come on. You're taking yeah. it so to the extreme so, when I'm trying so, to explain like a common situation. I That's agree with so you. obvious. That, it is very obvious. Hello, but I, someone's asleep. Sometimes the obvious needs to be stated. Like, or if somebody I don't think like so. Riley I Strain, think more real he, Riley Strain is not passed out, but he is so wasted Wait, what? that what do you mean? Like somebody that looks like Riley Strain did. He may not be able to say no if somebody came up to him and tried to do something to him. Oh, okay. Got you it. know what I mean? Like, because he's so out of it. He may not know which way is up or down. Yeah. Yeah. Like you. So, yes, that's very extreme, but the obvious still needs to be stated yeah, because that, it that, still comes up. That's in just a very obvious being taken advantage of in a situation, um, <laughs> like so yeah. blatantly obvious when the common situations is uh, two people feeling different in that situation. And one person not feeling like they can confidently say, hey, stop without being judged and being put down. That is the common situation that people run into. Not, not so much that. If somebody, if a man in this situation 
sees a woman that can't stand up on her own accord. It is so obvious, bro. If you try and pursue that, you're going to go to jail. Like, come on. You know, it doesn't need to be explained. Uh, there is no consent. You have to be able to be mentally present to give consent. Uh, but I think the more common situations are the ones people are worried about. When there's no alcohol involved, you have situations where women have stated over and over and over and over and over again that they don't feel comfortable saying no, not because of anything having to do with what could continue in that situation, but they're worried how the person in front of them will see them because they said no. And that needs to not be taken into account in those situations. No, you have to be selfish. It's not even selfish. You just got to be confident. And selfish. Well, <laughs> I think just confident, whereas if you don't feel comfortable going forward, verbalize it, dude. And if the person in front of you is not confident in themselves enough to be okay with that, then you just dodged a bullet anyway. Yeah, so, and well, just being I honest. think there's also situations where you fear what the person's going to do in certain situations if you say no. Again, and dodged if, a bullet, though. Yeah, but because being well. confident reduces the likelihood of being assaulted. And I want to make that very clear because it's something that a lot of women, when they're in the situation, don't understand and don't know. That the more confident you are, the more you're reducing the chance that you could be assaulted. And there are studies on it, and you should yeah. look it up. Yeah. Um, no, I, even I holding, agree. even if you're walking in a par dark parking lot, it's walk just funny with confidence extreme. and president presence, and it increases your likelihood of not being assaulted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Which I is, know where you're coming from, and I do think that those examples are really important, but you just tend to go to like the extreme. No, I saw when, a comment like, and I replied to oh, it. That's gotcha. why. Okay. Because that somebody said somebody not saying no is not a reason to like go ahead, basically. Like them not saying no is not go ahead. Of and course. I, yeah, there's certain situations where people can't say no. And yeah, that doesn't mean go ahead. Of course. No, I agree with you. However, in a situation where no alcohol is involved and there can be situations where the person isn't comfortable saying no, that's why we have to just be aware in those it's, situations. It's but clarified. if you can't say no, you just shouldn't be in that situation anyways. I agree. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it goes both ways. It is not only a man or a woman problem. It definitely goes both ways. So, But I think that I just wanted to mention that at the end there because I think it's a really common misconception, even one I had myself, um, about just carrying yourself with confidence and being confident in saying no um, and just really sticking up for yourself. It goes a long way more than you realize. Absolutely. Because women aren't taught to necessarily be that way. At least they weren't. Yep. So um, we're going to keep following the P. Diddy case, you guys. And, and just so you know, one thing that we're going to do is we're going to be taking these videos, these lives, and turning them into videos, by the way. So if you see stuff come out and you've been here for the live, then you've probably already seen it before. Just FYI. Um, but if you're on here hanging out with us and you're having a good time, make sure you hit that like button and leave a comment under the video when you're done. Uh, we appreciate that. That is the most support that you could offer for Thought Riot Podcast. I see A.R. Hayes is in here. He is another content creator. Check him out. Appreciate you stopping by, A.R. Um, and we are going to get into the next topic. So what was the Idaho 4 topic that uh, you brought today we were talking a little bit of earlier about uh the questions around the uh uh the the money situation because you said a content creator had recently brought up a topic around money that we covered a few months back and they added a couple interesting things yeah so if you guys haven't seen why money matters the it's an idaho for video okay in our playlist that we did several months ago um based off and what started it was drip drop came out with 
a breakdown of the million dollars that the University of Idaho had received. And there were a ton, like so many consultant fees on it. And we were like, that is super weird. Um, because anybody who knows anything about something like that with a business knows consultant fees are a way um, to not disclose what you're actually using that money for. Um, it's a it's a way that they can really inflate saying how much they actually spent and actually spend that in other areas. So Chris McDonough from the interview room and his wife, um, they did a FOIA request and they got a further breakdown of what that money was spent on. Um, but not fully still like yeah. the university doesn't want to give that information up. They do not want to answer questions about the money. They don't want to answer any questions. Um, and they, from, huh? From what we were talking about earlier, like they did a little bit of a deeper background on like some of the details of who got paid, but it doesn't answer any of the questions. And the fact that it doesn't. they were given a million dollars and 60% of that million dollars was given to companies that there is no record. There is no line item receipt. Like this to, is what this went mm. to and was paid for and why we did it. Like that's not it. It, it all goes back and, you guys, I didn't write well, we down the name of the consultant company. Who was it that covered this? Uh, the interview room. The Chris interview McDonough. room. The interview room. I'll pull, yeah. I'll pull that link too because we always want to give credit where credits do. Um, yeah, but, they dug uh, a little bit deeper into the topic because of Scott Green's book. Sure. Um, and I agree. There's a lot of They're red awesome. flags in there. Uh, I mean, that's what we've been harping on. Okay. The university has been throwing up red flags for us for a very long time um, since we the beginning of covering this case yeah. for us. Uh, the Following the money is something that we've always looked at. And that's why we think the 4chan theory has legs. Like if Brian Koberger mm. is not found guilty and there's reasonable doubt there, I think the 4chan theory should seriously be investigated um, because the university and Scott Green has a big, big interest in keeping that fraternity from closing. Because if they were if they were found out to have anything to do with this crime, uh, the national chapter of Sigma Chi could be shut down. And that does not just mean Sigma Chi. That means all of their little sub chapters that are called different things. And that is one of the biggest fraternities in the country. It is the biggest fraternity in the country. And that literally funds the school. Like schools could shut down <laughs> if yeah. Sigma Chi went under and was closed because They've had so many problems. They are on the verge of closure if they mess up. They have a fixer. Okay? They have a whole they have lawyers and a whole company basically on staff to fix their mess ups. Yeah. Yeah. And those 4chan posts, if you read them, there's things known in it that cannot be known pre-PCA that were known by whoever wrote that. Yeah. So there's something there. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Could it be Brian Coburn? Could Brian Coburger be guilty? I guess. Sure. Yeah. Uh, totally. Real, Brian Coburger's uh, the saw, oddities in him being on. in that area, they matter. I, I saw somebody in chat asking for personal information. Please don't do that. Or we're just gonna have to kick you. Okay. Uh I'm not gonna call them out. They know who they are, but please don't do that. Everybody knows not to share personal information over the internet. Uh, I assume it was probably a joke, but uh, not everyone understands jokes over text. So let's uh, stay respectful, stay honest, uh, brutally, obviously <laughs> honest and, and, and good faith here. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just had to delete the comments, but just going forward. Go ahead. Um, I, where was I at? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so they dug deeper into it because we saw a major issue with the consultant fees. So I thought it was interesting that they got more of a breakdown and they, 
I'll, I'll try to find the company real quick. I didn't write it down, um, but it's a company from Pennsylvania, <laughs> which kind of cracks me up is the consultants that they supposedly hired. Um, and they, the reason they did this is what sent off the red flags for Chris McDonough and his wife is the fact that the university, they found out through Scott Green's book that he was having meetings with Moscow police every day. That's what he admitted in his own book. And he inserted himself well, in the university day, yeah. into the investigation right away. Which is a problem. The yeah. questions that I think need to be asked here that are not asked in their live about this are why and how did this company that owned the home, the 1122 yeah. King Ro Road home, why did they gift it to the university? Yeah. I how, did they know Scott Green personally? Whoever owns that company or who the people that own it, do they know him personally? Is there, because I believe there's a tax break there. I think there's um, them having less liability over the home and lawsuits yeah. because a door didn't lock because you can like floor fires. Here's an example. Floor fires is the fire that happened outside Delphi before the Delphi case happened. And four little girls lo lost their lives in an arson and the mother survived. Well, the mother found out that the smoke alarms didn't work. Uh. So she sued the owner and he settled and she got a bunch of money for it. So in this situation, could family members sue the landlord because there's something wrong with the house that allowed an intruder to get in? Sure. I, Possibly. Yes. Yeah. And I, I don't want to throw too much information here because I want to be able to talk through a lot of that. Um, so when we covered this topic, uh, we dug into the monetary the monetary struggle that this situation could cause and or create in this scenario. Now, uh, I think there have been situations all over the world where certain money is given and everybody that is, has been in at a certain level within a corporation understands the value of uh, consultants. It is a very well-known fact in corporate world, not even corporate America, in the corporate world. I right? just mean, how do all and, these points connect? Because I think there's connections here. Sure. Uh, so with that, um, there is some very clear questions about did that money actually go to those consultants and and are those consultants claiming that on their tax documents um like can it be connected here right um now what's at risk here when we go into these details are the number of students that that was at risk of leaving the school or not coming back to the school. And what we did in this video is we broke that down into a monetary value where uh, there was a potential of 11,000 students different. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The difference was 4,602, 11,000 was the total. And when we figured up and divvied up the totals, for each student, each student on average brings $33,935 per year per person to Moscow, uh, Idaho. And uh, what that ends up coming up to annually, right? It's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah, it sure is. Bam. So it is $156,168,870. Life-changing type money, you guys. That is huge, huge, huge money. And that is the type of money that, uh, I mean, $1 million, okay? 
how were they going to guarantee that there was no reduction in students, which would then starve the community of $150 million <laughs> they, to get consultants because consultants look really good. They have a really strong image like, hey, we're doing something. We're getting experts. However, most schools already have these issues figured out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the fact that they got consultants and spent so much money, because if we're just going about it good faith, right? Don't even worry about it. If we're just going about it good faith, um, why did you need to spend $600,000 on consultants? Why do you do that? Because you're lacking something. What do you mean? So you don't fix something that's not broken. You fix something well, that's broken. What doesn't make sense is that the the crime happened off campus. Right. So why did the university get a million dollars? This crime didn't happen on their campus. Right. This crime, like, why are they, they're claiming they're doing all this to up security. Yeah. It didn't happen on campus. No, I hear you, but let's follow this, this thought real quick. Then we can go to that. So you only fix things that are broken. Okay. Not things that aren't. Okay. So they, they jump $600,000 into fixing their safety for students because they were worried of liability why would they be liable i i don't know why were they dumping six hundred thousand dollars into university security i think when it, it didn't happen on the university if they weren't worried about being liable I think it's a money grab. I think the issue here is that he's a businessman and he's making a deal with the University of Phoenix that he's got to pay up on. Yeah, but and we're he's a also got dollars. That's pennies. Is it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thirty percent of the students at the university bring in. $156 million annually. Oh, I guess that's a good point. Um, now add in that other 70%. Do you guys realize that the entire student body almost brings in a, a, a half of a billion dollars? So do you think he's going to risk his life, career, freedom for a million dollars? I don't. But what could cause someone to dump that kind of money into it if they're worried about being liable? But how could he be liable if it's off campus? I don't know. Why would you fix something that's not broken? It didn't happen on campus. Like, help me understand why we're dumping $600,000 into the security. I don't want to go tin hat. I don't want to go to, well, that question doesn't matter because obviously he stole it. No, let's go good faith down this question. Why would you dump a half a million dollars into security when there's nothing wrong? I, th I think the only question is, is there's some accountability there? And we don't know why. Yeah, but you can't like. There's no way to predict a a serial killer just Obvious, offing yeah. people. <laughs> I I hear you. Like no matter what you do, that will happen. But then help me understand why buy extra security. I mean, they had the state police and the local police upping security at their university. No, they spent six hundred thousand dollars only on security. Those consultants paired with an additional hundred thousand dollars in security cameras and monitors was almost that whole million dollars according to them was for security here i'll pull it up real quick uh 
Um, is it this video? Yep, right there. There we go. Mm, it's probably not big enough for anybody to read, but there. Whoa, that actually works now. Yep. There we go. I mean, I can't. Oh, here I estimated can read it. incurred and expected future security incident costs through 515 of 2023. Idaho State Police meals and lodging $158,000. Third party security $108,000. U UI increase in security $166,000. Consultants, comprehensive campus physical security review and plan, 212,000. Consultants, comprehensive security policy review plan, 259,000. Crisis media consultants. Have you ever wondered why we got character assassinations going on? Crisis. Media consultants, $23,000. Crisis media consultants, you guys, if you don't know, is there to control the media narrative to work in favor of the university. That's a big deal. Vigil, $12,000. Security technology, $28,000. Student lodging and meals, $1,400. Counseling and crisis support, $27,000, totaling $999,307. And I go back. Why fix something that's not broken? Yeah. Why fix something that's not broken? Well, it makes it just. Now, I do know that from Scott Green's book, essentially what he talked about was the past things that had happened at the university, like the situation with the sports student who assaulted a girl um, like they had some major headlines. OK, that made the school look really bad before this crime. And he said, you're only as good as your worst headline. Mm -hmm. And he said, you have to get ahead of them. OK, basically, you have to get ahead of these headlines. So when this crime happened, was that his goal? His goal was, I need to get ahead of this before this turns bad, like every other situation that's happened in the past 10 years. All of them turned bad and looked bad on us. I mean, it could be. I, like, don't, I don't know. Were they what? expecting it to be an insider? Was he there and, during that time? Because all of those situations, the teacher that murdered a student, the high, whatever you call it, like star um, sports guy who assaulted a girl, mm -hmm. like all the, a teacher who was um, abusing a whole sports team or something like that. All these situations happen from within the university, somebody doing something to somebody else within the university. Did okay. he think that this murder was going to happen from somebody else within the university? Mm. Like Sigma Chi, <laughs> you know? And he was like, I got to get ahead of this. All of these so situations turned back. That this could happen before it happened? Is what? that what you're saying? No. Then how do you it get happened. ahead of a crime? It happened. He heard about it and he was like, I need to get ahead of it before it makes major media headlines. But how does that help him? It helps him control the narrative so it doesn't come back, come back on him and the university. He makes the university look strong, like a united front, like they're united with the police. He's at the press conferences. The university's doing everything for the families, yeah. you know, making it so that they're not silent on the situation. So it, if he's not silent, he can help control the narrative. I mean, that's not a maybe. That is 100% what that is. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I'm saying, so is it because of that. the past bad reputation of the university? You said go down it a good faith way. Is it just because of the past reputation? Uh, I I don't think so. So what do you think? I again, I I have no idea. That's why I'm asking. Why are we attempting to fix something that's not broken? That's my whole point here, and I think that's a very big deal. So are you making the statement that it's not broken? No, I'm not trying to answer a question. I'm not trying to tell people what the reason is, but I'm I'm bringing up the concerns here that people don't fix things that aren't broken. There is a, a cause of an action and then a reaction, right? Well, upping and fixing security is a reaction what caused that brian koberger according to the official narrative did not go on that campus he didn't have anything to do with that campus from our our understanding well people claim that he was spotted on that campus stalking the victims uh, um I've never but again that. these are just claims oh yeah there's people that say they literally saw him on campus oh um that's interesting yeah but it's just, again just claims there's no proof it's just people saying things sure um but uh i i think that's a bigger deal that like i i don't know i feel like you're looking over that <laughs> when, what am i looking over you don't you don't fix something that that doesn't have a connection to the scene, the situation. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I think it's pretty obvious that there's something weird about that money and what it was spent on. Yeah. Like, I don't think that's normal. And there were a ton of lawmakers who also didn't think that they should get that money because it was an emergency fund. Like that is for emergencies and they didn't agree with what it was going to be used for that. it That wasn't emergency. Yeah. Yeah. They, they had to give it to them. They had to, I don't think so. Yeah. I, they didn't have any other choice, man. Why? It, because uh, you got to be able to show that you're backing the safety of the students and there wasn't a suspect. Well, according to the cops, nobody was in danger. I, I understand that, but that's playing into this idea that everyone in the world knew wasn't true. So you can't be like, well, because the cops said nobody was in danger, then we shouldn't expect the university to make sure their students are protected. No, you're you're already gonna you're starting with a flawed equation to get a flawed answer. There's already a flaw in that. I mean, I think it's all I think that money and him paying for all of that, it's all about it's all about perception. That is the only point of any of it do you is think, perception. Do you think that? Oh, I don't think I don't think so. Um, do you think these consultants could be investigators? Oh, yeah. So that was one thing Chris McDonough actually talked about. He said, when you look at. OK, so you guys, the company is Healy um, is what. I found on on here I had to go back and well, look but it's tag their video I I will um but it's Healy out of Pennsylvania and um this Healy consultant group they showed the staff and who they would have been hiring from here and it is literally investigators cops ex cops yeah that doesn't necessarily Possibly mean lawyers. that they're investigating the crime, though. But it's interesting. Yeah. I think that ex-cops uh, or anybody dealing with uh, security risk situations, um, well, he, actually just send it to me. I'll put it in the details, the description, um, would be able to identify any security risks. You know, yeah, they would. So, yeah, I I think it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. And I think the fact that they invested a million dollars into securing the university 
in my opinion, makes me feel like that is a reaction to a situation. Yeah, a murder. All we do is react. I mean, I don't... A quadruple but, murder. But it wasn't on the university. That's like saying, hey, Chicago, New York had a 10% increase in homicide. Let's... uh. Let's beef up our, our our police force here. The university didn't have anything to do with that. It's the same reason why Scott Green should not have been in the war room. Make the bigger. university didn't need to be in the war room. Not even didn't need to be. Didn't have the right no, to be in the war the right. room. Didn't have the right to have any say into this investigation and the direction it went didn't have the right to ha influence the community in any way, in my opinion. And I think Steve Gonzalez, no matter how you feel about him, uh, I feel for him in this horrible situation. He stated in almost every interview that there's other factors here that are concerning. And obviously those other factors are the university and anything connected to it. Yeah, he's been talking about the university for a while. I mean, he yeah. said very clearly that, like, I don't know, he said it a few times, and he was very clear about it, that he had issues yeah. with the school. And that it was more about money than justice. Yep. And I think that is, I think that is what it is. And I think perception um, is something that Scott Green is very concerned about. I think that's why his book came out. I think it's money and, and I mean, the perception of the university matters a lot for people wanting to sign up for the school. I agree. We just showed that, yeah. $150 million at risk. So increasing and beefing up the security so that people don't think this is a dangerous place to go matters for them. Giving the perception of it being, you know, we're, we care so much about our students and we're going to make sure, we're going to make sure that they're safe. Mm. And that could be where that additional money came from now, now you said those consultants so not only did the two hundred and twelve thousand dollars go to these consultants but two hundred and fifty nine thousand did right these are the same consultant company right both of these so the one company got four hundred and sixty nine seventy one oh $475,000, right? I didn't watch that video. Of, I don't remember exactly how much it was. I thought it was like... Well, over... don't worry about the money. I'm worried about what company. I think it is that company. Yes. Okay, so both of these charges, two line items here, are that one company. I believe so, yeah. So that company essentially got a half a million dollars. $475,000, yeah. half a million dollars. Okay, and that company is out in, in Pennsylvania, you said? Yep. Okay. Scott Green previously lived in New York? Yes. Okay. So Pennsylvania and East New Coast. York are a single day's drive. Am I right in that? Yep. Okay. I thought so. He even talks about passing through the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania in his book. So why did he hire consultants from the East Coast being on the West Coast? Mm, I don't know. I think I think his the connection. The nation? I think Scott. I think Scott Greens. I don't know. I I'd have to look more into the company. Chris McDonough huh. spoke very highly of them, uh, but you know I like to make up my own mind. Um, though I don't know that much about consulting. Uh, it's really interesting that he's from the East Coast. Hires a consultant company from the East Coast, and I'd be. He used to work for a law firm. Yeah, yeah, he's an so, attorney, right? No. I thought he was. I thought no. he was an attorney. He wasn't an attorney. He was a, a, I think he was like an accountant. 
gosh, I can't remember right now. He dealt with money, I'm pretty sure. He's a businessman. He's not an attorney. Um, but he 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 worked for a lawful a lawful firm. So I'm very curious what his connections are and how deep they run and like what kind of people he was involved with. Is his middle name Richard? I don't remember right now. I, Scott, um, gosh, what is it? It's Coomer Scott Green. Okay, that's it. Yeah, You're right. Okay. So, okay. Um, gosh, I need to do a background on him. Uh, Business finance. Executive director of... Heather said it was business finance. But... He served as the global chief... So he was the COO. The C what? Yeah. COO. It's well, it sounds like a small company if he's the COO and CFO. That's like super uncommon. Of what? Uh, a law firm. That's why I thought he was an attorney. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's he, not. Maybe he doesn't have uh so hang on. So see who's okay. Okay. So he just had inner workings with the legal system. Um, and, uh, and he was the CFO and the COO simultaneously for where was it? Lo Hogan levels is an American British law firm headquartered in London and oh Washington, D.C. The firm was formed in 2010 by the merger of the American law firm Hogan and & Hartson and the British firm Lovells, okay? Dude, that's a big deal. And he wasn't a lawyer, and he ran this? I mean... That's a big deal. That's not normal. I mean, maybe... Uh... It's, it's an a, international it, law firm, yeah, and he uh, ran it, it and wasn't much, a lawyer. It depends on how much money they make, though. Like, this is saying profit per equity partner annually is $1.029 Oh, that's not much. No, that's not much. That actually is not much at all. There are a lot of other uh, legal partners out there that are in, you know, the eight digits up. So $10 million plus range. But could this be a law firm that has a whole bunch of partners because it's international? Yeah, maybe. Could that be the annual income for only the U.S. firm? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Mm. But it's interesting the fact that he is a COO and a CFO of a law firm but isn't a lawyer. In order to be the CFO or COO, you would have to be an equity partner. Okay. So it's interesting. It's I mean, interesting. he moved away from that and his family to just randomly become the president of the University of Idaho because some, you know, old buddies called him and was like, you should be the president. And he was like, oh, my alma mater. I love it so much. It's so dear to me. Should I? You really think I'd be a good fit? <laughs> no, you're not a classic fit, but yeah, you would be incredible, Coomer Sky Green. And he was like, oh, yeah, I think I would be. <laughs> yeah. So he packs up and drives all the way to University of Idaho, away from his family and everything. I think the whole situation's weird. And describes in his book driving through the Pocono Mountains. I thought that was very intriguing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's weird. Um, but yeah, I think the money is absolutely crisis management. Um, I think that he needed to appear. He needed because of I mean, we know the numbers. OK, we know how much the university was looking at losing. 
if they didn't find a suspect, if they didn't find a person to blame this crime on so that everybody could be safe again and feel safe again. Uh, people were leaving in droves, okay? People didn't want to be there. Like, think, if you haven't ever seen our video on um, the Gainesville Ripper of Danny Rowling and that whole situation, it's kind of reminiscent of this. The whole town was terrified. And honestly, the Gainesville Ripper probably was more scary because it kept happening. Yeah. Um, over and over and over throughout a weekend. Pretty yeah. scary. And then the wrong guy was accused. They got the wrong guy. And then they finally got the right guy. Um, and it was all with a, like a K-bar knife type weapon. Um, wasn't it literally a K-bar knife? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it was. Yeah. And and yeah, I saw a few people asking or talking about it. A hundred percent. There's this idea that they're... Um, they're their student numbers, registration numbers went up. I don't believe it. So there are a whole bunch of, and it's not even that I don't believe it. I literally have evidence proving they went down. Um, but there's a whole bunch of factors involved that can control the uh, student body totals at the main campus. They, I forget what all the details are, but I think it is. They have six locations in total. So the one main campus and five other locations. And at those five other locations, uh, they can choose to include those head counts in the main campus or not. And at those five other campuses, they can also choose to include other uh, students that have been brought over from abroad, um, which can help pad those numbers. Well, I mean, I think you should break it down and explain why you don't believe it, because a lot of people do believe that the numbers went up. Yeah, um, I, I, it's because that's what they claim in their paper paperwork I know. they do that is what they claim that's what they they show as their official numbers that they actually went up yeah. so i think it should be explained um i think you should go into detail about it but yeah they were i think they were risking a lot and i think that this money was a way to make them um appear to be keeping everybody safe yeah yeah and I think that there's some, yeah, do I think there's some behind the scenes, like it's weird that they were talking to the investigators. I think the questions come where you start thinking about, okay, since they had these ex-law enforcement who are now consultants reviewing security on the campus, like were they involved and the university involved in the investigation by having multiple meetings a day? Right. with uh the police was that intermingling at all was yeah. the university literally in this investigation were they tampering with it mm -hmm. were there consultants involved in it at all it just i don't know there's questions there and um they're going to have to be answered i, I think that I don't know. I really think that Ann Taylor is going to have some questions about the university because it, it isn't normal to have a university involved in a homicide investigation at all. Yes, yes. Chris yes. McDonough made a good point in his video that made me think about that a little bit more because um, I, I already I already knew that that wasn't normal. But then he talked about think about like a murder at a Walmart or a restaurant, the actual business or entity themselves doesn't get involved in the investigation. They stay out of it. Yep. I agree. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't I make sense. And this didn't it. even happen on campus property. Yep. And still they're involved in it. Right. But that's, again, why 4chan... It gives 4chan more weight to me. It just does. It just does. 
the money I think matters too much to completely just ignore it. Yep. And the details within those posts. Interesting. But uh we appreciate all of you guys. This is an episode of the True Crime Talk Show. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Um, we had by far, like no comparison, the best month we've ever had last month. Uh, every single metric was over 200% from the month prior which got us, you know, 200% additional marketing funds. So we uh, should see another 200% increase next month. So just keep doing what you guys are doing um, and uh, bear with us as we make some changes in the show. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you, all of you. And please, please, please hit that like button. Leave a comment under the video as soon as this is done with any questions. Uh, with any questions, technology related, they I will definitely answer them. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but I will definitely answer them all. So just leave them under that video. And uh, here is this membership link here. If you want to come join the membership video. And Discord is a good time. Definitely good time. The one thing I will say is just be careful on there, you guys. For anyone that's new on Discord, just because they're in our group doesn't mean trust them. You should not trust anybody that you haven't met in person, okay? That is the the one rule. If you haven't met them in person, then you don't trust them. And anyone that is doubting that statement, sus. All right. All right, you guys. Yes, thank you all for being here. We are switching over to the uh, members video here. Hang on. All right, there we go. There we go. There we go. Awesome. It is interesting. The Pocono Mountains are seem so important for some reason. <laughs> really strange. Like, are all roads going to lead back to Pennsylvania? It's super weird. Also, everybody being involved in the University of Idaho is super weird. Like, all the, the whole defense, pretty much. The whole uh, prosecution, the judge, literally everybody. The whole town. All right, you guys, that is it for the True Crime Talk Show. I just shared that link, and uh, we are moving over to the members show. And we appreciate all of you, and we will see you on the next one. Yes, have a good night, everyone. Thanks for being here again, and see you 